Hello viewers, this is a series of lectures on film theories and you may be wondering that films are meant to be made, watched and enjoyed. So why break your head over building a theory of films? The answer to that question is that it is because of the theories of films that today we understand and appreciate cinema as an art form, as a language and also as a collective dream. Film theorists have given a stamp of respectability to this nascent art form and they have established a, se this, a separate entity for this art form called cinema. Now here is a Wikipedia definition of film theory. Film theory or cinema studies is an academic discipline that aims to explore the essence of the cinema and provides conceptual framework for understanding film's relationship to reality, to the other arts, to individual viewers and also to society at large. So broadly that is what film theory is. And from the very early days of cinema, thinkers in different fields like writers, uh, philosophers, psychologists, sociologists, they have all given their quality time to their thought to this nascent art form to understand how it casts a magic spell on its audience and what is its power, what is the secret of its power. And film theory actually, if you go into the history of film theory, film theory has developed parallelly hand in hand with the technology of cinema. You now perhaps you remember the first public demonstration of moving images was held in Paris in the year 1895 at the Grand Salon in Paris in December 1895, where uh, workers leaving a factory and train entering a station, etc., was shown by the Lumiere brothers. Now, in the year 1896, a French philosopher called Henry Bergson, he wrote a book called Matter and Memory. It's a beautiful name, isn't it? Matter and Memory. And in this book, he mentioned about this movement image, a time image. And he said that in order to understand this new kind of image, which is moving, moving image, one has to apply a different sets of aesthetic criteria, a different set of principles for understanding. So he was the first thinker to give serious thought, to theorize this, the new kind of image that was, was being made called the moving image. Now we shift our attention to America because films really became popular in America uh, right from, you know, the 1903, from the success of the Great Trend Robbery. So it's no wonder that some of the earliest film theorists were from America. So one such film theorist was a writer and a poet whose name was Vashel Lindsay. And he published a book in the year in 1915. He published a book called The Art of the Moving Picture. So it's a very lively, it's a very readable book and it gives a nice insight into this nascent art form of cinema. And Linse was an avid movie goer. He loved going to the movies. So he was very well aware of the various kinds of movies that were being made. So he classified three kinds of uh, films. In fact, he gave a new name to this new art form. He called it photoplay. So he said that there are basically three types of photoplays, the photoplay of action, the intimate photoplay and the motion picture of splendor. Now the photoplay of action, meaning those are, you know, high action like chase films or comedy films, so which are action packed. Whereas the intimate photoplays were like family dramas, romantic comedies and things like that. And the motion picture of Splendor was, you know, with grand sets or beautiful locale where the, everything looked very sp splendid and it, uh, the film was very high on spectacle value, just like uh, either Birth of a Nation or Intolerance by Griffith. So that way he identified the cinema, I mean, rather he classified cinema into these three categories. And he also noticed and formulated its elements in the narrative of cinema which could rival and surpass the other existing art forms. So he compared cinema with other existing art forms and some of his chapters are like sculpture in motion or architecture in motion or painting in motion. 
He also obviously compared cinema with theatre and he identified 30 differences between photoplay and the stage. So he did quite an exhaustive study, I must say, and entirely on his own initiative. And towards the end of the book, he writes that the invention of photoplay is as great a step uh, as was the beginning of picture writing in the Stone Age. So he understood that cinema has a very bright future. It's a very important invention in terms of technology as well as in terms of, uh, terms of cultural intervention. And it's going to hold sway over more than 100 years uh, in the human mind. So he was a prophet in that sense. After that, many film theorists have come. So we will study another film theorist uh, called uh, uh, Hugo Munsterberg. But before going to Hugo Munsterberg, I would like to say that out of all the film theories that have been formulated till date, we can classify them into two categories. Some of the theories are prescriptive theories, which means that these theories tell you how a film should be made. And the Russian film theories are primarily this prescriptive kind. Whereas the other kind of film theories are descriptive theories. And in descriptive theories, the theorist takes stock of the existing body of films and then tries to understand the patterns of representation in these existing films. Okay, so these two types of film theories, prescriptive and descriptive. Now having said that, we now move on to another film theorist from America and a contemporary of uh, Vachel Lindsay. His name was Hugo Munsterberg. Now Hugo Munsterberg was a professor of philosophy at Harvard University. He was not an avid film goer and the film theory that he developed, he was actually commissioned to study cinema and develop a film theory. Uh, Vachel Lindsay had done it on his own initiative. Nobody had commissioned him to do that. Whereas Hugo Munsterberg was commissioned to do that. Now Hugo Munsterberg hailed from Germany. His uh, schooling and his you know, academic uh, training was in Germany. So in Germany, he had studied philosophy. He had also studied psychology. And he had applied the principles of psychology and he wrote treatises on industrial psychology, medical psychology, educational psychology and so on and so forth. All right. So that was his background. And then he had migrated to America after the First World War and he, he took up a job at the Harvard University. Now at the Harvard University, actually the film makers or the uh, cinema industry, in order to get respectability, they used to uh, approach the scholars that you please do a scholarly study of this art form and you write an academic paper and that will give a, give a stamp of respectability to our art form. You know, people like Griffith and all, they were very keen to get respectability for the, their art form, for the art form that they practiced. And that is when they knocked at the doors of scholars. And Hugo Munsterberg was one such scholar. So he started watching films and in the year 1916, just about eight months before his unfortunate death, untimely and unfortunate death, he published this book called The Photoplay, A Psychological Study. So he had borrowed this term photoplay from Vachel Lindsay and then of course he applied the principle of psychology and he brought out this book, The Photoplay, A Psychological Study. And in this book, he talks about an inner life of cinema and an outer life of cinema. Inner life of cinema is the cinema as it is understood or as it is uh, perceived by the viewer, rather as it unfurls or unrolls in the mind of the viewer. Whereas the outer life of cinema is when it is projected, you know, the you load a projector with the film can and you play the projector and the lights are on and the screen lights up and it comes to life with the moving images. So that is the outer life of cinema. All right. So that means he, because he was a psychologist, he turned his attention rather than to the making of films, he turned his attention to the reception of films or to the perception of films by the viewers.
all right and uh, one of the films that had moved him greatly it was the neptune's daughter by herbert brennan and of course he watched griffith's films birth of a nation and intolerance and all that and then i mean every day he used to have, watch at least one film when he decided to do a study of cinema every day he used to watch at least one film and then of course he uh, restricted himself to narrative cinema that means he didn't bother about the the other kinds of films that were made which were basically actuality films or travel films or sometimes educational films or archiving of in, uh, important events or all so he didn't bother about that he restricted his study to narrative films that means films that told stories and of course those days it was only silent films all right and and hugo mustafa never imagined that cinema would be talky some day because he thought that uh, as a silent medium it was complete in itself and it was a self sufficient medium so that's an interesting thing uh, so now uh, coming to this uh, hugo munstersberg's uh, theory uh, he wrote to picture emotions must be the central aim of the photoplay all right so that is one of the key concepts in his book the photoplay a psychological study that means what he is trying to say that cinema exists the existence of cinema is justified in stirring the emotions of its viewers if a movie cannot stir the emotions of its viewers then it's not worth making all right so that's what he is trying to say all right acha and then he says that cinema actually exists in the mind of the viewer and this is a very very interesting concept that what is cinema is it the film reel that you unroll and you you know you put up against the light and you see the individual uh, frames is that the uh, is that cinema or is it the projected pictures that come on the screen is that cinema what is cinema so he says that cinema is something that actually takes place gets constructed in the mind of the viewer the projector may be the projecting the picture the screen the screen may be coming alive with the uh, moving pictures but unless and until there is a viewer there is somebody who is watching the images the cinema does not get made so unless and until that human mind is there the human eyes are there to see and a human mind is there to process it there is no cinema there is no movement and this movement doesn't stop at this um, persistence of vision only he predicted as early as 1916 another phenomenon called psi phenomenon okay and what is the psi phenomenon it is that when you see the individual frames those are you know actions frozen at a particular juncture all right so frame 1 has a, a one particular stage of the action frame 2 is a slightly displaced stage of that same action all right say for example frame 1 is the uh, phone lying like this frame 2 will be the phone a little bit raised like this frame 3 will be the frame, uh, phone little bit raised like this all right and when you see all the frames running at 24 frames per second you see a continuous movement of this phone being lifted up like this all right but he said musterberg said that there are missing frames frame number 1 is like this frame number 2 is like this frame number 3 is like this there are these missing frames but our eyes or our mind do not perceive the missing frames we perceive a continuity of action and that is that our mind fills the gap okay it's a psychological phenomenon that's why it is called a psi phenomenon all right so he said that unless and until this human mind is active there will be no cinema there will be no movement on the screen there will be no cinema therefore cinema is an art form for the mind or rather for the brain just as painting is an art form for the eyes and music is an art form for the ears cinema is an art form for the mind all right so therefore he studied cinema entirely from the spectators or the viewers point of view that how a viewer uh, makes sense of cinema in his book there are chapters which are titled attention memory and imagination and emotions so munsterberg is trying to say 
That attention means that the filmmaker first and foremost has to grab the attention of the spectator. Then he has to hook the spectator. So there has to be something spectacular or a close up of an object or something happening on the screen to grab the attention of the spectator. Then is memory and imagination. So once the spectator is hooked into the film, the next stage is to unfold or unfurl the spectator's memory, memory and imagination. So he will basically try to, he will identify himself with the characters on screen and either he will remember his own life or he will imagine himself in that position. So simultaneously, memory and imagination both are working in the mind of the viewer as he is watching the film. Okay, because he's identifying himself. All right, he's, he can relate to the actions that are being shown on the screen. Why he can relate to the action that are being shown on the screen? Because either something similar has happened in his own life, which is triggering his memory, or it is something that he wishes would have happened in his own life, which is triggering his imagination. So that is why it is either memory or imagination. And then the third chapter is emotions. So after his memory and Im imagination are, are triggered, he is emotionally moved. Either he laughs or he weeps, either he feels happy or he feels sad. And that is the success of the film, to emotionally move the spectator. If the film is unable to move the spectator emotionally, then the film is a failure, according to mm, Hugo Munsterberg. And the director of the film, the filmmaker, instinctively understand these things. The filmmaker had no filmmaker had studied human psychology before making a film. But the filmmaker instinctively understand these things. And he also instinctively understands how the technology of the cinema can be deployed to capture attention, to trigger memory and imagination and then to emotionally move the viewer. Okay, so he knows that the power of the close-up, he knows the power of dramatic lighting, he knows the power of editing. So these are all the cinematic tools to grab the attention of the viewer and to move him emotionally. And the filmmaker doesn't have to really learn it, he knows it instinctively, according to Hugo Munsterberg. So I read out a longish excerpt from this photoplay, and it's an interesting excerpt. The attention turns to detailed points in the outer world and ignores everything else. The photoplay is doing exactly this when in the close-up uh, a detail is enlarged and everything else disappears. Memory breaks into present events by bringing up pictures of the past. The photoplay is doing this by frequent cutbacks. The imagination anticipates the future or overcomes reality by fantasies and dreams. The photoplay is doing all these more richly than any chance imagination would succeed in doing. We think of events that run parallel in different places. The photoplay can show in intertwined scenes everything which our mind embraces. Events in three or four or five regions of the world can be woven together into one complex action. There is also another uh, side to this activity thesis, uh, he is saying, that he is saying that cinema is eventually an art form. We have to accept that it is an art form. And an art form is complete in itself, meaning that when you appreciate a work of art, you know, you appreciate it in its totality without bothering about its utility values. Cinema, when you are watching a film, you are appreciating it as an art form without bothering whether, you know, uh, uh, whether you will emulate the dress codes of the characters that you see on screen or whether you would like to go to the places uh, which you saw in the film. So you don't have to correspond your real life experience with the movie you watch. The world of the movie is self-contained. Maybe a place that you watch in the movie doesn't exist. Maybe it's a construct, you know, created in the studio. All right. Or two, three places have been intercut together and uh, 
of cinematic space ha has been created which doesn't exist in reality all right so you don't have to correspond your lived experience with your movie viewing because cinema gives you a self presents a self contained world to you and you have to appreciate the self contained world as it is so cinema ha by itself has a justification for existence musterberg says that photoplay as art okay while the moving pictures are lifted above the world of space and time and causality and are freed from its bounds they are certainly not without law so in the world of movies their own laws apply all right it may not be the laws of gravity or the are the other kinds of laws that you experience in your real life but the world of movies operate in their own laws in a nutshell this is munsterberg's theory uh, which he propounded in his book called the photoplay now munsterberg also wrote after writing the photoplay he was also commissioned to write other articles and so, some of the interesting articles at least two of the inter interesting articles i would like to mention one article he wrote for the cosmopolitan magazine the name of the article was why we go to the movies this also in december 1915 it got published and there he tried to justify so what is it that they get out of the movie so he tried to justify that that because it moves us emotionally there is a kind of satisfaction there is a kind of catharsis that happens at the end of every movie and that's why it is good you know it's a nourishment for the human mind and that's why human beings are naturally drawn to the movies so he wanted to justify cinema that way that it is good for the human mind because it nourishes it all right the human mind is enriched gets wiser by watching a good film but then later he also wrote another article which is called the peril to childhood in the movies so that means whether children should watch movies or not because those days there was no censorship working in america so all kinds of films were made so there was a certain alarm among the church organizations and even other educational institutions so he was doing a study on that uh, of course he couldn't finish that study because he, he had a prematurely he died but he was doing the study on that what exactly is the influence of cinema on the child's mind you know the violence and the other things that are watched shown in the films how seriously does a child take it and how seriously it affects his mindset he was doing this study but then he couldn't finish this study so the, this is the thing and what munsterberg said that see cinema is a what is it on a flat screen some images flat images are being projected but the three dimensionality the illusion of three dimensionality the illusion of movement etc everything is a creation of the human mind so it is the human mind that creates the cinema and is the human the cinema exists in the human mind so that is in a nutshell uh, munsterberg's uh, theory so i just end by reading uh, two of the excerpts he says cinema does not follow the arrow of time or the laws of gravity or even the everyday causality of life you know in cinema things can fly or time can move backward so in real life life moves only in one direction time moves only in one direction from past to future but cinema can easily intercut between the past and the future it can easily in the blink of an eye it can go from one space to another all right so therefore it doesn't follow the laws of causality which we experience in our lived experience so cinema is that way is is the realm of magic it is the realm of dreams so munsterberg said that and also he said that cinema has to have an artistic integrity fulfilled through the unity of action and character so because it's an art form it has to be true to itself it has to have an artistic integrity and that artistic integrity is fulfilled through the unity of action and character meaning that once a character is established in the film uh the filmmaker has to be true to that character the character has to have an organic growth okay the character has to follow a character trajectory he has to develop on screen and of course the narrative also has to have its own logic to allow the character to grow because otherwise the viewer will not be able to identify with the character and he will not be emotionally moved at the end of the film and unless the he is emotionally moved the cinema will not be justified 
for its existence. In 1916, these concepts were propounded by Hugo Munsterberg and today also they are as true as they were in 1916. Having said that, I would like to conclude by saying that uh, Vashel Lindsay as well as Hugo Munsterberg both lived and worked in America because films really became a popular art form in America. But then Hollywood develop, developed the craft of cinema and the theory of cinema, actually the mecca for film theories, shifted to Europe. And after Munsterberg, all the major film theories have been developed in Europe. And uh, the first uh, school to develop uh, very elaborate, sophisticated film theory was, of course, the Soviet school. Then the French also developed film theories. The Germans developed their film theories. So film theory, the mecca for film theory or, or film studies became Europe rather than America. And America concentrated on developing the craft of cinema and taking it to perfection. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.